Okay. Uh, here we go. Hi, everyone. We're starting up. Our feed is live. Uh, I want to welcome everybody to the final presentations for TMORF, our first TMORF. Uh, the name is stuck. At some point earlier, as we were had people filing into the room, I started referring to everybody as TMORFers, which I'm not 100% sold on at this moment. Uh, but uh, we'll go through. How we'll, about my TMORFin Power Rangers? <laughs> I'm less comfortable with that one. <laughs> but, you know, uh, the, the names grow on, on uh, uh, you know, groups get to decide what they're called. True, true, true. Um, so as all the participants, we got to call it Teamorph because we put it together as all the participants of the ERS uh, and here will collectively come up with a name for each other at some point, I'm sure. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to Justine. We're going to see all of our final presentations. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the format later today, so I'm not going to talk too much about what uh, about that right now. Uh, uh, Justine. Hi, everyone. Um, I just wanted to start out by saying thank you for joining us today um, and a real hearty, hearty, thankful gratitude to all of our participants for taking this time to join us for this week. And we are located in Toronto, and we recognize that many Indigenous nations have had long-standing relationship with the territories upon which we're located. The area known as Takaranto has been taken care of by the Anishinaabek Nation, the, um, the Huron-Wenda, and the Métis, and it's now home to many Indigenous peoples. We acknowledge that the current treaty holders, the Mississaugas of the uh, Credit First Nation, um, and that this territory is subject to the dish with one spoon, wampum belt covenant, and the agreement to peaceably share and care for the Great Lakes region. We also want to um, acknowledge that today is Juneteenth, which marks uh, two years after the Emancipation Proclamation, but when it, the slaves in Galveston, Texas, uh, were finally acknowledged that they were freed, um, and it's a national uh, celebration in the United States, and as we are from the US, we recognize that day. And I think it's especially important to acknowledge that, that we have solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and any anti-racist efforts out there and fighting for Black lives at the time of these overlapping crises. And um, Toaster Lab work specifically is about revealing hidden histories and spaces. So I think acknowledging all these layers is especially relevant right now. We also acknowledge our tremendous privilege at being able to join you today with the support from various organizations and our lives that are very stable and lovely here in Canada right now. So we're benefiting from an enormous amount of white privilege and we're acknowledging that. We also wanna acknowledge the problematic use of Zoom and Facebook. Um, while we've become very important to uh, sharing time together and connecting with those that we care about, uh, both reinforce those systemic issues in society, which we've already talked about. Um, Zoom's concern for its users and their security has, and safety has been critiqued from long before the current pandemic, and it's recently put its profits ahead of the security by publicly stating that we'll cooperate with the police, sirens, um, and not encrypt communication for unpaid accounts. And Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg has also recently abdicated his responsibility for false information posted to the company's platform, despite the issues that it's caused in dividing society. So we critique while we participate. Um, we're also super grateful for the Canada Council for the Arts for supporting the larger umbrella of what we're doing right now. Toaster Lab is Andrew Semfrey, Ian Garrett, and myself, Justine Garrett. And we have been the recipients of a Digital Strategy Fund grant, which is supporting a two-year deep dive into mixed reality performance methods. Um, and the T-Morph is one aspect of that. It marks the one-year point in our two-year process. And we have had two symposiums, and now this would have been our third in person. Um, and we are super excited for what we're covering. The second year of the process will be focused on documentation and sharing after this amazing series of events. So uh, thank you all for joining us. And we also want to thank, too, our amazing uh, Toaster Lab Mixed Performance Atelier Advisory Board, some of which who are joining us today which are made of master makers and uh, thinkers and creators from around North America who are joining us in this deep dive process. So thank you. Uh, I, I like it's impressive because there's, and as you can sort of see with, with everybody who's participating here that it's, 
we exist in a large number of intersecting overlapping communities and doing that of this work. And part of the goal of Toaster Lab working in this way is that we sort of found ourselves at a crossroad where um, we felt very lonely um, in trying to explore various things. We knew some people were out there, but this has been about opening up um, people who might be dabbling or not sure which to go, which way to go, because they might be coming from different sectors that have different um, un, unshared vocabularies. And so sort of building a, a community and shared vocabulary around that has been important to us. Uh, this is, as Justine mentioned, Gathering 3. Uh, so Gathering 3 originally was meant to be live and in person in Kingston, Ontario, as part of the FOLDA program, the Festival of Live Digital Art, which last weekend uh, and, uh, and on either side has had a lot of fantastic programming. They've moved online and we've also uh, uh, moved online. So we've spread things out a little bit. Toaster Lab's annual general meeting where we gave sort of our, our state of the atelier address and talked with the advisory board uh, members was on June 4th. You can find that archived mm -hmm. on HowlRound and our own website. Uh, T-Morph, which is now where it culminated here on the 19th, started last Saturday on the 13th with a public kickoff event. Also, that you can find in the archive. We've been meeting a lot in there, and we'll talk uh, a bit more uh, about how this worked in just a moment. Uh, uh, but we also had a, uh, we had a special presentation of a performance that's come out of a, a long-standing Coaster Lab uh, partnership but that has been developed uh, in these COVID times. Uh, we, with our partners at Dancing Earth uh, around Indigenous futurities, Dancing Earth in cyberspace, which is also archived in those same spaces. So we've spread this out over the course of a couple of weeks, intersected with some other events uh, to try and maintain the momentum of what we're doing, keep up the conversation, but adapt to the current scenario in which we find ourselves. Well, um, I want to thank everybody who was able to join us last night for the Indigenous Futurities presentation. That was wonderful, yeah. It went uh, really well in a way as I was uh, chatting with Beth Cates, who's been part of the, the Team Warp process and is on our advisory board uh, shortly thereafter, uh, in which we confirmed that this is the way, the first time that everything worked the way that it was intended to was, of course, the public presentation. Yay. So we just sort of trusted that it happened, and that's just the way that this works. Um, know that every time you run into one of these technologically mediated performance projects, very likely you may be seeing it work the first time, or just not see what's not working. Um, that's, that's, that's how this uh, uh, circuitry sausage gets made. Um, so how did we work? Here we are in our hackathon. You can see we, um, as I mentioned, we started on Saturday. We then had a number of internal pre-scheduled meetings. Uh, we had a, essentially an office hours for a few, uh, for most of the day on Sunday, where we work through identifying who's going to be working on what and how. And I'll leave it to our co-producer, Julie, uh, to talk about that in just a moment of how those how we organized ourselves. Uh, we had planned to check in on Wednesday, which we did, and we got to get an update on all the projects. In the intervening time, uh, most conversation happened in self-organized ways around the projects. Uh, we knew that because people would be working remotely, we'd have to have some flexibility. We primarily used uh, a Discord server as our backend so everybody could see all the conversations, the constant stream of notifications of like amazing questions and progress beyond where I thought anybody would get. I had to, whenever I did jump into a conversation, I'd be like, and also you're really far along. So like, don't, don't, don't worry. Um, like we're going to see some really amazing projects in these presentations. Uh, I assure you. Uh, and then we had, uh, we had, you, we used a bit of discord because it allows you to hop into voice channels really, um, uh, allowed us to have some casual conversations, but then we also, uh, use zoom for more of the, the face to face work as well. Um, and that allowed us to to do something which we originally thought would uh, would be like two two and a half days of in person intense work, and spread it out so people could still attend to their socially distanced lives uh, at home right now and everything that comes along with with adapting to that way of working. 
Uh, to talk a little bit more about the the conference together, I want to give a lot of thanks to Julie Driver from Artifact VR, who came on as co-producer. Uh, we had been talking about Hackathon since before um, we put in our original DSF application, because we knew it's something that we wanted to include it, and we've kept up as we've hosted other formats of symposiums. Uh, and it's something that became important for us to, like, that's the thing that we wanted to make sure that we held on to. Uh, because as much as we might know a lot, we wanted to expand the conversation. So it's not just like, this is what Toaster Labs says you should do. These are different ideas that are coming out that we want to support, that we want to get excited about, but other people and in, in supporting those things. And we'll get to that too in a minute. So I want to hold it, uh, uh, hand it over to Julie uh, to talk a little bit about how we, how, how this all worked and, and, and more about the hackathon. Julie, take it away. Thank you very much, Ian and Justine. Um, this was an amazing week. I just have to say thank you, everyone. Um, we started out uh, our process of proposing projects on Saturday. We had 13 projects proposed in a meeting. And over the next 36 hours or so, through a lot of chatter on Discord, I saw a lot of links go by. I'm going to have to catch up on all those videos and articles. Hackers formed into five interdisciplinary teams. And through the week, uh, people crossed over, helped other teams. It was really wonderful to see this collaboration. Um, one of the formats changes between a virtual hackathon and an in-person hackathon would be presentations, technical talks, uh, demonstrations, and whatnot. Uh, how we tackled that with a virtual hackathon was asking people to provide pop-up presentations. We had three pop-up presentations. Um, I outlined hackathon project scope, which hopefully helped people um, to uh, make their scope a lot smaller for their projects. I think everybody has uh, awesome ideas and probably they will carry on after the hackathon. Uh, the purpose of the hackathon was to tackle one aspect of a project. Uh, we had an Ask Me Anything About Sound with Ryan Joyner. And we also had a Working with Digital in the Yukon with the Nakai Theater. The office hours window and midweek check-in um, Sunday and Wednesday. These meetings gave, as Ian said, uh, teams face-to-face -face contact uh, with organizers, with mentors, with other teams, and a chance to report their progress and ask for help if they needed it. Uh, teams took turns stating their goals, talked about the progress, um, and what kind of help they might need. Mentorship. We had, I think, close to a dozen mentors. Uh, thank you so much, mentors. Uh, the hackers needed you. Thank you for being available to help uh, with technical and general questions. What I loved the most about this hackathon was... Um, Watching the evolution of the project proposals becoming distilled into final solutions. And I did not peek at anybody's presentation. I really wanted to. I'm looking forward to being uh, awed by your presentations today. Um, I enjoyed uh, getting insights into the creative process via Discord. That was a highlight for me. Um, if you're at a hackathon with 20 people, 100 people, 500 people, you can't wander around to every team and watch the wheels turning. With Discord, uh, we had a much better idea of how projects were progressing. So thank you. Thank you for sharing your chats with the entire group. Um, from what I could read, the virtual hackathon format worked. I saw so many links to shared documents, um, Git repositories for the Unity projects, and a lot of Zoom co coordinates, and a lot of people working really late into the evening. So you'll see the hard work everyone put into their projects uh, when you watch the presentations. And without further ado, what I would like to do is uh, introduce the five presentations. I'll just mention what they all are, and then I, I believe the first one will get started. So project number one is Haunts. It's a mixed reality performance that invites audience members to explore the supernatural with a team of ghost hunters. The second project is Fable Game. It's a training manual in the form of a mixed reality game sent back to us from the animals Yukon 2400 AD. Holodeck Hamlet. 
is imagining the future of live performance in the limitless future of digital, interactive, and AI mediums. Dream co-creation. This group explored Mozilla Hubs as a template for developing a platform for friends from around the world to come together in VR to share and transform their nighttime dreams. And finally, Monument for Memory is an immersive media sculpture that seeks to explore what it means to create a monument in the year 2020. That's it. Thank you very much and take it away. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Liz Fisher, and I am calling in from Texas, Austin, Texas, and I was the project lead for Haunts. So uh, we are going to be jumping into uh, a, brief, a brief presentation to show you what we spent the week making. So here we go. So the big idea for Haunts was we wanted to create a mixed reality production that follows a team of ghost hunters through site specific locations as they seek to uncover the mystery behind certain supernatural phenomena. We wanted this storyline to follow a branching structure that would actually respond to audience participation. So the audience would have a chance to not only uh, connect and talk to our characters and actors, but they would ultimately decide the course of the narrative so that direct communication would end up being essential for our story to move forward. Now, the fun part that we really dove into this week was figuring out this ghosts, because the ghosts were going to be a blend of augmented reality, sound design, and old school magic tricks. And our hope was that this entire performance could actually be live streamed for increased accessibility during these COVID times. So in order to set an achievable set of goals for the hack, we narrowed it down to three very simple ones. Pick a city and a historical event that we were going to use to base our entire story around, clarify the branching structure for that story, and then, you know, bring a ghost to life. Very easy. Uh, so now to talk a little bit about uh, the story and the narrative that we constructed over the course of the week, I'm actually going to invite my collaborator, TJ Young, to the virtual stage to talk a little bit about the narrative. TJ? Hi, everyone. Uh, great. So I'm here to talk to you about the narrative of Haunt and how we kind of took this branching narrative approach and why we picked the story that we did and how we go about it. Um, the story that we landed on, uh, we landed on the mystery surrounding the, the servant girl annihilator, which uh, was a serial killer in Austin, Texas, between the years of 1884 and 1885, killed about eight people, uh, at least that they attribute to him, and they were killed in their beds at night um, because of a lot of circumstances, not only unreliable eyewitnesses and the fact that it's 1884 and policing wasn't, you know, uh, the best then, and some of the victims were actually, most all the victims were women, uh, and some of them were African American. These mysteries remain unsolved. Uh, so we kind of struggled with the fact that uh, if we're telling these stories about these women, especially these underrepresented women, how are we going to go about that, and why this story is important to us. Um, so one of the big things is that in, in looking at ghosts, we're able to shift the focus from the killer to the victims, right? We're able to give them some sort of agency in the world and we're able to interact with them, especially uh, as we continue the, the conversation around the way that history has treated women and uh, black indigenous and people of color. We found that this is actually a really nice story to hone in on because uh, kind of at the basis of it, the way that the ghost hunter can um, resolve the situation is by speaking their names, right? The fact that their names have been lost to history and why they might not solve these mysteries. They're able to still give some humanity to these victims that are lost. Uh, and this is a speculative fiction world, but we wanted it to be able to be based in reality. So that way, if people say, is this thing real? They're able to find some research and then continue on that journey by themselves to learn more about these women, learn more about their past and also learn um, it's also they can also continue to say their names as well. Uh, next slide, please, Liz. Great. This is an example of our narrative flow. Um, you will see here that for the most part, it stays pretty linear until we hit what I call the dead end node, right? Um, within these nodes are breakdowns of the information that is obtained throughout the story, um, location things. It's also where uh, um, 
uh, other members of the design team can drop information and we can continue to work on it. Uh, but you'll see that at the dead end node, we have a point where we split. Uh, and this is actually where we get to the really uh, important part, which is like the induction point, right? Where we have two pieces of technology because we understand that there's going to be a barrier of entry to uh, it, taking in our story. Not everyone has access to a smartphone as well as a computer screen, so they, m they might not be able to experience the augmented reality uh, portion of it that would uh, push a choice for the audience. So we wanted to give them something else that they could experience. So that way they could still participate uh, in communicating with um, with the actor about the choice they wanted to make. So we separated that into sound and shadow. Uh, where we'll have a demonstration a little bit later where you the actor will encounter a sound and if you don't have augmented reality that sound is going to inform which decision you make but then you're also going to be able to encounter a visual shadow uh, and then you'll be given the choice do they follow the sound or do they follow the shadow and then from there we have some consequences we have uh, and it just kind of spirals out. But there are four unique experiences uh, at the end of it before it all comes back together for a recap. But within that recap are actually consequences of the uh, audience's choice that will carry on to future episodes of this show. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, and you get to pick the future, right? This is a narrative-driven audience interaction that's supported by the live stream chat function. Uh, a lot of things that we have been looking at are how do we capture that live and exciting uh, sort of feeling that we get from watching live theater, and we're thinking participation, right? And if nothing else, we can say, type in, do I follow the sound or do I follow the shadow, right? Something that we can look at really quickly, and then we can give that uh, the actor that information either through the chat function and the technology that they're live streaming through uh, via a text, a thousand different ways to let the actor know, hey, this is the path that we're going on. And uh, all of the deciding factors in that inflection point happen by this inflection point stimuli, right? So these things are activated. We are looking at those stimuli as a, a core mechanic in our storytelling. So a lot of times we will, as we're working with like our live magician, uh, as we're building our story, we say, okay, we have this, we have this sort of um, point where we can branch off. What do you think is going to be a good idea? And then we kind of build the story middle out, as I like to call it. Right, uh, we take the information about what we know is capable within the space, with the actor that we have, with the limitations that we have, and then we build the narrative and bookend it from there. So that way, we are not writing impossible situations for our actor. Uh, we're keeping them safe, especially in COVID times, uh, and we're also making something that uh, we know that our AR team can accomplish, our sound team can accomplish, and the actor can accomplish in a seamless way. So that way, we aren't sitting here for months and months trying to perfect something. Uh, that just doesn't work. Uh, it seems easier for us to bend narrative around our limitations, which aren't limitations, but rather opportunities, mm -hmm. than as for a narrative to impose restrictions around the technology and the action. So yeah, that's kind of how we have landed on our narrative structure. Fabulous, thank you so much, DJ. I really appreciate all that. So now we're gonna pivot a little bit and talk about what it means to try to bring ghosts to life in this context. So as we've already said, ghosts uh, in, this, in this production would manifest as a, a combination of augmented reality, magic, and sound. Uh, and in the blending of these three, they can work both as a tandem in tandem in order to create uh, an entire sort of spectral entity or as isolated events, which gives us a little more flexibility in our narrative structure, allowing us to sort of pick and choose what sort of experience works best for each moment. Now, uh, specifically for this hack, we decided to really key into the sound and the AR elements, uh, so because we wanted to take advantage of the incredible resources and mentors uh, that Timor uh, provided us. So our experience today doesn't unfortunately incorporate magic, but don't forget about it because it will come along later. So another really important part of developing this technology for us was about uh, figuring out how it fit into the narrative. And TJ already spoke very eloquently about that. Uh, but I just also wanted to point out one other thing that we have considered and are building into our sort of narrative structure, which is this idea of training the audience. Uh, because of course our augmented reality is coming through a phone or a tablet, 
and having those audience members uh, be very clear about when they need to raise that phone or tablet up to the live stream could be a little clunky. And it is our goal to instead make sure that the entire thing is sort of wrapped in the frame of the narrative. So that from the beginning, the audiences are learning that your phone isn't just a phone, it's actually a detection device. Uh, so that this is actually built into the structure of the story, it's explained by our characters, and actually starts to help build our world before we get into any of the essential plot points. So we have been thinking a lot about what this training, uh, sort of putting quotation marks around that, looks like, not only um, from the very beginning when an audience is trying to download the phone, uh, walking through the very basic user uh, implementation of it, and then also creating very distinct, not only like bits of dialogue, but visual and auditory triggers so the audience can know when they should start lifting up their phones to look for our augmented reality ghosts. Uh, TJ also spoke about this, about our concerns about accessibility, recognizing, of course, uh, the Im immense privilege that it means for someone to be able to have two devices, but also constraints around bandwidth. So while live streaming is something that uh, we are definitely interested in because of all of our backgrounds in live theater and desperately wanting to get back into a place when we can all be in rooms together again, uh, that obviously isn't possible for us in this moment. So that live stream would also be able to be captured and played back by folks uh, times beyond the initial live stream so they could take part in the play and uh, enjoy their ghost hunt for themselves. So let's get to the fun stuff. Let's show you uh, what we've actually made and stop talking quite so much. So just a little bit of context for what you're about to see. Uh, we actually decided to basically create a short performance that represents that first inflection point that TJ talked about earlier. This would also be the first sort of full instance of uh, our ghost, both in sound and augmented reality in the midst of the performance. So this video I'm about to show you illustrates also a lot of the elements of what we would expect our live stream experience to be uh, because we wanted to sort of model it after a little bit of that sort of Blair Witch docu-style uh, feel. So we have the direct address to the camera, handheld cinematography, and uh, we were also very fortunate to be able to shoot this scene uh, on site. So there's our inflection point. Here we go. So, um, this is where the address should have been. Let me look real quick. Right. All right. Now, that's three. Um, that um, would be seven. Uh, so five would be here. It's like nothing here. Look, not even a sign of where they lived or anything, which kind of sucks. But you know, progress and all that crap. This feels like a dead end. Um, like, I, I don't know what to do. Um, uh, I'm going to head back. Uh, maybe I missed something. <laughs>
so obviously uh, we did not uh, get to see our AR ghosts in that moment, but we did get to show you a little bit of what it would look like uh, when the uh, ghosts would, what the, the types of markers that our audience would be looking for when a ghost shows up. Now we did actually build the app and uh, this next video I'm going to show you sort of cuts to just that little end portion where the ghost is supposed to show up. So uh, y'all can see what it looks like when that AR filter comes in. Something else that I just wanted to point out in that video that might be apparent to folks who are listening in with maybe awesome speakers or great headphones, uh, a lot of the sound in this is actually super directional because we were trying to make sure that audiences could very clearly distinguish the area of the shadow versus the area of the sound. So big shout out to uh, Alan, our team member, who helped us develop all of that. So let me jump back real quick. And now I'm, we're going to show you a film of what the AR looks like in the midst of the live stream. I don't know what to do. Um, uh, I'm going to... Head back. Uh, maybe I missed something. So there's a little taste of what an audience member would actually experience when they were able to download the app and uh, watch part of the live stream to sort of witness our ghosts. Uh, big props in this moment to Patrick who created our ghost uh, through some fabulous green screen and mo motion capture work. So good, great job on that, Pat. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about like, where do we go from this after this intense and beautiful week? What happens next? Uh, we're hoping to continue developing the story. Obviously uh, this week was a lot about trying to get together uh, a really tight little scene that we could execute and execute well, but there's the rest of the story that we really want to dig into, not only continuing to build out the uh, narrative structure, but building out our AR. And one of the ideas that we talked about early on was instead of having to have our target image as that overlay in the video, uh, exploring how we might be able to embed visible targets inside of the live stream to make it feel a little bit more magical. And then also playing with the dimensionality of the ghosts, of the augmented reality ghosts, so that maybe they're not just those two dimensional ones that live only inside of the screens, but perhaps come out into the audience's world and continue to follow them through their everyday life. Um, obviously, we didn't uh, have much time this week to dig into magic, but that is something that we're still really excited to play with and see how magic now fits with our sound and augmented reality. Um, and then also starting to look at how obviously today's performance was all pre-recorded, which makes things a little bit easier, but being able to add those same types of uh, live manipulations of video that you saw in our pre-recorded uh, bit just there to give that same feel in a full performance. And then the last thing that we're really excited about since uh, this project sort of came out of a desire to talk about stories from specific communities that have maybe been forgotten about time, uh, since now is a, a, an especially important time in our history to look at those old stories and why we need to go back and think about them and, and uh, retell them, uh, figuring out how we could actually use this sort of team of ghost hunters to go from city to city, exploring uh, very specific stories that live inside of those communities uh, and building that piece for each individual community. So here's the list of incredible collaborators that I had the good fortune to work with this week. I'm so grateful for all of their time, all of their energy, all of their smarts. It was an intense but unforgettable time. So big thanks to all of them for their help. And of course, thanks to you more. It's been a pleasure. Excellent, thank you. Um, moving along with our, our projects, uh, I'm sorry that everybody has to follow everybody and lead into everybody because um, they're all fantastic, but excellent work uh, 
for Team Hans. Uh, team Team Fable. Let's have you jump in there. Um, uh, I'm pressing all the wrong buttons. Um, <laughs> hi, I'm Jacob Zimmer. So I am, will just hit my share screen and we will go to our presentation. And I think that's here. Um, so uh, thanks everyone for having me and, and us uh, at Nikai Theater. Um, I'm Jacob Zimmer. I'm the artistic director at Nakai. Uh, we're located on the territory of the Kwanlin Dun and the Tan Kwachin Council uh, in the Yukon Territory, which is, has self-governing agreements with 11 of our 14 First Nations um, in the territory. Uh, I came to this uh, one with these desire to think about tech in a, a low bandwidth place because we live in that reality and there's so much of this world that that I get excited by, but also when people say, you know, stream this on your new iPhone, I'm like, ah, okay, we've got to work out some things. Um, but I also came with this, uh, an idea um, for a game that uh, would be called Future Histories. And it's a fable and it's three to six players get together uh, with their smartphones and, and a world sort of appears before them shared between their smartphones. These are very rough uh, concept sketches I've made. Um, there would be real animators used. Uh, so the three to six players would come together and, and on their phones, they would have a bit of a shared reality, but also a separate reality. Uh, so they might be receiving instructions that were different from each other via audio or text. Um, and that the game function in, in the activity would involve them moving around uh, and, and adjusting their position in whatever play space they had. And that positionality of the phones and the performers uh, would be the sort of unlocking uh, mechanism or, or create some win conditions. Um, uh, this also had a really strong belief inherent in it that uh, I wanted to do, um, that we wanted to do some future fables, that we wanted to talk about the future um, in, in a way uh, that's sort of different from how it's mostly talked about um, in gaming especially, but also just generally in narrative. We do a lot of post-apocalyptic stuff uh, that is just sort of used to further a sort of all against all uh, story. And that's not the only story. And, and potentially because we've been telling that story, we end up with an all against all world. Um, and so who showed up uh, from the group? Um, Ryan, Tara, Kat, and Aiden uh, joined in this hack and it was, it was really great. We ended up uh, because we have uh, from Berlin to Pacific time, um, and, and a bunch of spots in between. We ended up working quite separately from each other, uh, but we had an amazing original conversation um, and, then, and then continued to do some work separately. And, and, and I wanna say thank you to those, those folks for, for showing up and really helping this project. Uh, one of the things we realized quite early and was probably always true is that we're sort of waiting for the phone technology to catch up with my weird idea of uh, Twister meets fables. Um, and, and so the sort of the phone world of the phones knowing where each other are in space and all of those things are, it's not quite there. Uh, I wanna say thank you to the mentors. I had some great sort of offline and side conversations about even the terms to use when asking people about how this technology might work. Um, and that's really useful uh, because I and, and the rest of this team in this circumstance are coming from the sort of purely imaginative space. It's great to, to run into folks who actually know what they're talking about. Um, but we decided uh, if we couldn't work on the phone tech that we would work on the story tech uh, because this question of how to adapt fables into a game. Um, I've, I've been saying that probably for about a year, uh, but never actually taken any shots at doing it 
or even thinking about how we would communicate that with each other. Uh, so we talked about a bunch of things at the beginning. Um, we talked a lot about the fables and, and the use of animals and this idea that whatever the story was would be narrated by an animal from the future who has sent back this game as, as a, a subtle training manual for the future so that, that humans playing this game um, will be better prepared for the future that is to come. Um, and that the fables would somehow encourage that behavior. So we're increasing collaboration, we're increasing play, we're increasing sort of nonverbal literacy. Uh, there's a lot of play in this stuff that is part of it. Um, so, so like, it's kind of like charades. We also talked about, this is very inspired by a game called Space Team uh, by a Montreal game designer, uh, which is called, a, it's a collaborative shouting game. Um, but it was the first game that gave me the, it only works if everybody's in the same room. And that was the, it was a real opening for me for what, what might be fun with a cell phone. Um, because then the performance is, is in the game itself. Uh, and we also talked about seasons um, and animals. And as we got to talk about animals, we talked about if, you know, in thinking about what a better world might look like, that one of the things that was probably going to need to go away was uh, the human tendency to think that we are not part of nature, to think about like, oh, we need to improve the relationship between nature and humans, um, as if those were two separate things. Um, and so that, that became a, a sort of a, a, a spark that, that led us to seasons and to cycles and to those stories and how animals cooperate. Um, so we sort of reduced down to the fable game. Uh, and we started that with saying, okay, everyone pick an animal. And uh, these are the animals people picked. Uh, we had uh, ducks from Minnesota who also go to Canada. They have summer homes in Canada. Um, Ryan looked into wolves and, and the Yukon wolves. I, I did a bit of looking to, to foxes, which uh, both are home in, in my, uh, where I was born in Cape Breton, but also are very present in Whitehorse and in the Yukon. Foxes are kind of like our raccoons for uh, Toronto whites. Like they're, they're just in the city all the time. And I walk home and I'm like, hey, dude, how you doing yet? Yeah. Um, so they're around and, and, and I'm interested in the animals that deal a bit with humans. Um, Cat was interested in muskox, uh, which are pretty amazing beasts. Um, Aiden, Aiden took a look into uh, the, the goats that live uh, in the Yukon. Um, and so we, we looked at these and, and, and what their seasons were and thinking also about gestures and beginning to think about these things that we don't really have a way to play. And, and I don't know if people can see my video, but like that, that how, if we're talking about the goats, how do we get, you know, a bunch of players to put their hands up by their heads um, and sort of move towards each other and back right like how would how does the how how might that be an encouraged thing um to do uh and so we looked at all these animals and and, and some of their gestures and thinking about movements that we could create i went down a particular rabbit hole of um the fox and the hedgehog um where this this story that is actually in a, you know it's there's old fables and then there's Isaiah Berlin wrote a book um, or a very short thing that he says was sort of a joke and now has been taken quite seriously by um, tech uh, thought leaders quote unquote um, especially but that that the fox is the like generalist who has many many ideas and the hedgehog only has one idea but is very good at it. Um, and this tension between the single focus deep work and the like open space uh, wanderer uh, got me really interested. I think in part because I, as I went down rabbit holes, I'm like, oh yeah, I'm a fox. Okay, like how do we, and that maybe the future is actually in the collaboration and cooperation between foxes and hedgehogs. Um, 
and how those, those, those animals might work together. So I prompted folks to start thinking about their animals sort of on a spectrum of fox and hedgehog and to, to be thinking about how, how we might move past some of these um, either ors also. Um, and so we don't really have much to sort of present in a presenting way. Um, this is an example of some of the draft that Tara made in the Google Docs. So we ended up with a bunch of different Google Docs that uh, I would bounce between and other people would bounce between. Um, and that really started uh, with this, this Edward the Duck um, and Steve the Fox. Uh, taking these stories and moving them into, um, you know, the duck telling a fable that is about a duck, but the duck has an opinion about the fable and is trying to teach something. Um, we also talked about the ways that, you know, fables are always about the time that they're written as much as they're about ducks and, and, and foxes. Uh, so, so in this one, for example, Tara and I were bouncing back and forth on issues of displacement and gentrification um, of, of un mis misunderstood privilege, right? That the duck is like, why can't everybody float on water? What's the problem with flooding? Um, and the fox has a problem with flooding because the barrows. Like, so, we, you know, we have these stories are adaptable and that's one of the things that I, I really loved. Um, and also in these moments we had a moment of, you know, how do we introduce the duck, do some basic flocking, right? Can we get people to all stand in a corner of a room? Um, how do they move around? Um, and yeah, uh, and so we we were just doing these prompts and, and getting towards a, a way that the stories work. Um, and I really, I wanna thank the group for, I'm, I'm sort of a, I'm often an executive dramaturge. Like I, I come in with an idea. I don't know how to write the scene, um, but I, if, if there's something, then I can work with it. Um, so I'm really deeply grateful for the, uh, these folks who joined in and, and created some things that then I could see. And there were some just great ideas. I, the migrating, getting people to like, all of this, how to take up the space really opened up for me in this in this storytelling, and then a little bit of how how the fables work, and just that the hook of uh, an instruction manual sent back from the past, from the future. Um, next things for us, and this is fairly quick. Uh, yeah, is is this is is the development iterative development sequence, um, which is you know play draft find funding. Uh, play, draft, find funding, and repeat. Uh, this project, I want to keep open with these people on these stories. It's also a thing where we want to commission uh, stories from storytellers and writers in the Yukon um, with, with some focus, particularly on First Nation authors. Uh, we very intentionally stayed in sort of Aesop and European traditions, because that's the tradition that we all in the group came from and and one of the things that maybe the animals will teach us is we shouldn't retell other people's stories or mess around too much with that or at least have a connection to those stories um so so that's a big part of this is starting to commission some new fables and some fables that that emerge out of other than aesop uh and grims um although those are also really interesting and of course the the world of what what is the digital creation and how does that go on phones and how is that created um, becomes a question, of course, and how and how to to create those things. Um, but also, there is moments of this morning of looking at things where I'm going like, oh, this is maybe just a really fun tabletop role playing game um, <laughs> uh, that doesn't need like the phones are not helpful or or what or how you know what maybe it's less about there being uh lots of digital content and more about just using the sensors and and the phones and the cameras working and it not being so much about the creation uh and those that that kind of came up from this and and i think i said on wednesday i'm really i love when uh hackathons end up with non-tech results um, even if even if I feel a little bad presenting and not being like, I made a cool, we made a cool app. Um, but yeah, 
we're working on stories and so maybe it goes a little slower um this is a giant sloth um which is ish uh which lived in the yukon many a uh, couple of ice ages ago um so we're continuing to work on that uh thank you for everyone these um this is a project that that we'll be developing and so any any thoughts uh, prompts, places to look for funding, um, or solving of technical problems is super welcome. Um, you can reach me at all those places. Um, yeah, and again, if I, if anyone else, uh, Tara, I know you're on the call, like if there's a, anyone else who wants to, to speak to things that came up to them while, while working on their part, uh, that would be great. Um, other than that, I think that's it for me. Awesome. Thank you, Jacob. Um, we're going to jump to, uh, I'll go ahead and, and keep us going. I know that we've got some time reserved for the tail end of it. Um, uh, we're going to move now to our Hamlet project. Where's Team Hamlet? Um, I know that there's been a lot of uh, interesting work and definitely the screenshots from that have been, uh, have been fascinating. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, I'm Jesse Friedman. Um, I'm proposed this project, and I am. Oh, are we? Oh, wait for yeah. the screen. I'm just waiting for the screen to come up so I can see. There, there we go. go. Okay, great. Um, uh, I'm Jesse. I'm the. I'm a theater director based in Brooklyn. Um, New York, which is Lenape territory. And um, this is Holodeck Hamlet. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Great. So um, Holodeck Hamlet is a concept for a live streaming performance and that's streaming uh, either to browser or to VR goggles. Uh, and the idea that I'm starting with is it's one live actor who is performing Hamlet with an ensemble of AI holograms, which is fictional technology, in a holograph virtual envi uh, environment. So um, the starting point that I, I pitch for the hackathon is how do we simulate fictional technology using existing technology? Um, and uh, the idea, the concept for Holodeck Hamlet is based on Janet Murray's book, um, Hamlet on the Holodeck, which was written in 1997. Um, Murray is a scholar of literature with a background in coding and wrote a book about the futures of digital technology and fictional narratives. So what she saw emerging in fictional narr narratives as they begin to move into uh, computer spaces, whether that's virtual reality or online chat rooms or whatever was emerging at that time. And she uses the hollow deck from Star Trek as um, kind of like the paradigmatic guiding example of what these, uh, these um, digital technology narratives will become. Um, and she identifies the following characteristics. Um, they're immersive so that you can be completely immersed in a hollow deck. It's completely interactive. Um, it's transformational so that it can take on, you know, you can be, if you want to do the hollow novel uh, Hamlet, you can be in steampunk Hamlet or you can be in the old globe. You just kind of pick what your skin you want to look like um, and that you have agency over everything. You can make all the choices that you want uh, and that the narratives are multi-form. Um, and this, uh, the technology, um, particularly for the AI, I believe is what is most limited in terms of being able to create those experiences because you can't have a completely interactive, um, uh, experience with, um, with a, with a, with an AI character that can respond to all of your choices realistically. That's actually where it's most limited, which is kind of exciting. Um, but all of these criteria that she describes are also very present in the experience of making theater 
or making art. Um, and I'm, I was interested in just like the tension between um, perhaps those ideas as somebody who is very, who's, I mean, my life is live theater um, and I really enjoy spectatorship. Um, one where I, I do sit back and all I choose is what I want to look at on stage. And so I think that both um, creation and spectatorship are unique experiences with unique properties. Um, and this is a way of exploring both. And also, I, I, someone told me about the book and I thought, oh, that sounds like a play. I should probably read that book and figure out what this is about. Um, so I brought it to the hackathon with the project of simulating fictional technology, a fictional actor, because I, uh, the, the person who is putting on this play in this scenario is a fictional person and that they have a story and a context around them um, and that there is a fictional relationship to that technology. So the project also becomes about what is our relationship with technology. It's not about putting an actor in technology, but getting to uh, observe their relationship and reflect on their relationship with technology while the audience, the spec, the audience spectator is, is participating in another type of relationship. Um, so the group that we formed together was this amazing, uh, ambitious, generous group of storytellers and designers who were interested in uh, a project that involved um, dramaturgy and theatrical storytelling. Um, the event of going to live theater, but also mixing live performance and film um, or other types of multimedia uh, experiences. Um, and so that was the team that we did. And we, we, the process that we embarked on was kind of like a devising theater process. Well, we were also trying to build technology and build um, uh, moments to show, uh, we were also discovering what the play world was or what the performance world was and asking questions along the way. Um, so uh, I, I'll start off by talking about like some of the features of uh, the dramaturgical questions that I was tracking as a director as we were involved in this process. And one is the drama, we had, you know, the dramaturgy of Hamlet. What is the story of Hamlet and why is it an appropriate um, text and all of the, the existential themes, the, uh, the um, meta theatrical themes where um, being a spectator and a performer are brought into question um, uh, explicitly thematized and within the action of the text. And that complicates in very exciting ways when you start to talk about like, well, just doing that in uh, a digital environment is, is really interesting. Um, the spectatorship experience, what is, uh, what is the story of somebody who is putting on a play, who is entering into a digital theater? Because uh, a discussion that we had about this play is, or about Hollow Deck Hamlet is, we, we really miss live theater as live theater makers. Um, there's something a little bit unsatisfying personally about watching theater on stage without being able to choose where I look. I miss being able to feel my seats and feel people next to me. So the spectatorship experience that this thought experiment of Holodeck Hamlet provides for the audience member has a whole set of storytelling um, consequences for and raises questions. Um, there is the, the actor, the story of the actor who is playing Hamlet and performing this, this play um, for that, that streaming audience. Um, who is that person? Why are they doing that? I mean, aside from everybody wants to play Hamlet, um, if you had access to this advanced fictional technology, why would you use it to put on a play and stream Hamlet for a fictional audience? Um, and that becomes very, I mean, all the more, it becomes uh, 
very relevant we, because that's exactly what we're experiencing in New York City um, as theater artists under the restrictions of COVID is that we can't collaborate directly with people, uh, our collaborators, live actors, we can't be in a room and watch theater with other people. So um, this project has like the spectatorship experience and the relationship between the actor who's putting on this like nostalgic or retro spectator experience um, has a story that's related to this contemporary context. Uh, and that's also about access too. Um, there's a story of fictional technology um, is, uh, how far in the future are we, do we imagine we are when we are imagining this technology that's capable of creating a cast of artificial intelligence holograms that can perform an entire play of Hamlet? Um, do we think that this technology is hacked together from like a PlayStation 7 um, or is it something that was, uh, that, that everybody has access to um, and it, it was really made uh, for hollow novels and it's being used exactly as it's supposed to be used or is it used to pilot a spaceship, but it's, it's been kind of cracked open for this other purpose uh, because this person has this need uh, to, do, to put on a play to tell a story for people and act it out. Um, uh, and then there's the story of particularly like AI and machine learning, which was a big discovery for me because I don't know a lot about AI and machine learning, but um, uh, the imperfections of artificial intelligence that are built into the process of teaching a machine uh, becomes the action of the play in, in very exciting ways. And that learning about artificial intelligence, so we could put AI and machine learning into represented in the play in some way, became dramaturgy about the, the technology as a character. And that when we see it on screen and how does it behave, um, all of that was, uh, became the background, the research about what, this presence is when it is anthropomorphized and not. And what are the features of that interaction? What does AI do well? What does AI not do well? And therefore, what is going to make this, what are the obstacles in performing this play, which is what plays are about obstacles. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so the first element that we, looked at creating or talked about was the virtual holographic environment, um, that it would include the presence of a theater, uh, one with seats and a proscenium uh, and a virtual stage, and that that spectator would be in the theater so that you can have the, the person putting on the goggles or sitting in front of the browser can have that remembered experience of being in a theater uh, and that there is a virtual stage that it, the play is being performed on. Our goal, we talked about like, yeah, we should do this in VR 3D experience using Unity or Unreal Engine, which some interface better with AI than others. Uh, and that ended up not becoming one of the goals for this project. So we just represented it with the following images in 2D to illustrate some points. Um, so, in this, you see the spectator who is looking at an actor, and there is this false proscenium. Uh, and the agency that the, uh, the spectator or viewer has is in their point of view, which, which actually makes a big difference when you're watching a live performance is that you get to choose which actor you want to focus on and uh, you know, which part of the choreography, or, or if you want to just kind of stare at a scenic element um, or you can see the, the curtains. There's also a difference between, oh, uh, let's go to the next slide and see what's on there. Um, there's also a difference between the, the, the size and scale of a theater or the design of a theater that's very determinant of a production. Um, the feeling of being in you know, Lincoln Center and seeing Shakespeare um, uh, or in a small black box theater where you're a couple feet away from the actors. 
whether you're watching it in a deep thrust or in the round, those like make the performance. So being able to um, make those choices, uh, experience yourself in a different theater and uh, experience uh, like a different skin or design concept for, for the production like Steampunk Hamlet or in the Old Globe. I, I would kind of love to see Hamlet in the Old Globe or Steampunk Hamlet, sure, why not? Um, so those are the, the ways in which uh, um, the virtual reality um, and the 3D virtual environment, um, we, we started to imagine those. Uh, and our limit, we just, yeah. And, um, and then we begin to see like, uh, there's one live actor and there's one holographic actor. And when you put them in the same space, really what that's the interaction that we decided that we wanted to focus on is the interaction between a live actor and a virtual actor um, in a digital environment. So uh, everything we're doing in our production, our presentation is 2D, um, but it would translate nicely to 3D. Um, so that's our focus of our hack. And the first thing I would talk about a little bit more about um, AI and machine learning in the context of this project is, I'm gonna start by talking about the dramaturgy on it. And I'm gonna turn it over to Michaela, who's gonna talk about the actual technology. Um, the, we talked about a lot of different, uh, a lot of things we could put on the palette to create this fictional AI. Um, <coughs> because we can't upgrade the, we can't achieve the technology, but we can achieve the impression of it. So a composite or a collage of human and computer elements to make this actor. Uh, and we talked about voice, that there could be digital voices um, using the AI tools that are available to us or a human voice or um, the text that the, the the actor speaks it can be the text of hamlet because what what bots do really well is say their line when it's their turn to say their line um or for some reason they could go off script and it could be sensical it could be nonsensical um but that it could be uh scripted or it could be improvised and that there could be um an ai feeding text that is being generated in the moment. Um, we talked about the movement of the, that actor, of their face and their responses. Are they responding in real time and what are they responding to? Those being, um, uh, those being also potentially generated by uh, an AI. Um, this was a big surprise to me is learning more about what it means to teach a bot. Um, and that if somebody wanted to teach a bot to be an actor in a play, you would have to teach it how to do that and what would go into that. Uh, so when we were, so the first, you know, a big aha for me, a, like a wonderful, oh damn discovery is that while you're watching somebody perform Hamlet with these AIs that they are making is that you're, what you're watching on stage is them teaching a bot how to perform Ophelia and that the bot is learning how to perform, uh, perform Ophelia and that the corpus text that we would put into this bot becomes the criteria, becomes the play text. So if we chose moments where we, do, where we went off script and Hamlet was no longer the, the text of Hamlet, that it would be generated from the corpus text, um, but that you choose that corpus text based on what would you do to teach a bot how to play Ophelia, and that you would have to teach, you know, you, what you would feed it, Judith Butler, Cosmo Magazine, Stanislavski on acting. Um, that was exciting to learn about. Uh, and then this, this idea, which also extends to all aspects of this fictional technology is uh, failures or glitches as features. And that um, uh, 
the way that you teach a bot is uh, by telling it, no, you did that wrong. Um, and so highlighting all the obstacles to putting on a perfect performance with an artificial intelligence robot, as opposed to uh, trying to create the most perfect simulation of it, but creating one that's highly flawed and has lots of glitches and getting to see when this bot is failing one, why is it failing? What is the performance asking the computer to do that is causing it to fail? And that being a trigger for these, uh, the ops, the, you know, there's the rub, the obstacles. Um, so those, that, that is the dramaturgical el element of AI. And now I turn it over to Michaela, who's going to talk about the technological elements of it and what we've done. Yeah, next slide, please. So basically, I love the process, how we actually decided what the AI or what the chatbot will be. We are not, it's not an AI bot yet, it's a, it's a simple chatbot. And basically, um, I think one of our conversations, once we decided that it will be of Ophelia, um, when I was feeding the texts to the, the corpus, um, in order to train the chatbot, I was thinking who Ophelia is, and I was thinking about how Shakespearean Ophelia, like how the character is actually a weak character for me. Maybe that's just a personal, personal opinion. But then I thought, okay, how? And I also felt, you know, she was she 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 was in love with Hamlet, but it was not her love was not fulfilled. And so I thought about who, like who the AI character is in that scene and what is to be a woman and how you defined, define womanhood nowadays, but also in Shakespearean times. So then I decided to feed, we decided together to feed her with, as, as Jesse already mentioned, Judith Butler and Simone de Beauvoir, but also some, some interesting texts from Cosmopolitan and yeah, I had, uh, and also Lady Macbeth, which I find one of the strongest characters of Shakespeare. Um, and so I just, so basically I, I made the chatbot in, in Microsoft Azure AI platform. And I started with Q&A Maker where basically I, I, I made the corpus where I distinguished between Hamlet and Ophelia and Ophelia uh, uh, was composed of this body of discourses from Butler Beauvoir and uh, the Beauvoir and, and, and Lady Macbeth and Ophelia. And basically for now it's a limp, simple, simple chatbot that um, if you feed it the Hamlet's, um, Hamlet's um, speech, it, it will respond as Ophelia. And sometimes it will or often it will off, go off script and and will will tell you something from uh, Simone de Beauvoir's book about love, or I, I try to connect it thematically so that it makes a little bit of sense, but it's also not not completely in line with what Shakespeare wrote. Um, the um, so yeah, the, that's the that's the chatbot. What what would we we would do in the next development phase? Next slide. We will we would probably enlarge as as Jesse already mentioned. There would be more characters. So we would we would train different characters with different texts. Um, also, the the bots would need to distinguish between other bots and how they communicate within each other, which is also a an interesting question: How? How to? Um, we we also in order for the chatbot to get more intelligent, in order that it can, for instance, improvise, we still need to connect it to Louis AI platform, which is uh, Louis AI, which is a software also on Azure platform, or depending on what we decide, we would implement other machine learning process, uh, processes. Um, uh, we would connect, we need still con to connect the speech, 
the speech to text and text to speech recognition um, in order to chatbot to understand what we say and to produce also speech, but we will, but that's actually something that is not that difficult to make. It was just like time restraint didn't, um, yeah, it was time restrictions. Um, we, we would connect the AI bot with the interface in a VR engine such as Unreal and Unity in order to create a 3D avatar. And then we would through testing with actors so that, and through, through um, acting with, through the interaction with the avatar, we would train the avatar in order to get more real, but also still stay within its scope. That's it. Great. And now we're gonna show a video and wrap up. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So sorry, I was muted. I was talking and was muted. My oh, apologies. All good. <laughs> um, we were really excited to see how far we could get the development of the AI. And this week, um, we wanted to give a short performance of what uh, our proposed live stream of an AI and an actor, live actor interaction might look like. Uh, in the scope of this week, we created a 2D environment um, for this interaction to happen in. Um, we created a system with our actor in front of a green screen and an AI driven animated character. So we'll go there next. Oops. Can you guys hear the sound? No, shoot. No, that's why. Technical difficulties, stand by. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it's noble in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take on. Lacey, your sound is off when you muted the computer, uh, the your microphone. You muted your microphone and that's where we lost the sound. Technical difficulties. Welcome to a uh, presentation in COVID. We're gonna start from the top folks. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's still no audio. And uh, I think that we're gonna we're gonna keep moving along. What we'll do is with this sample, um, we're gonna be documenting everything, and we'll we'll um, 
have a page where everything gets archived. I know that there's already been requests for some of the media samples yeah. because they don't come across quite as clear on Zoom. Um, I'm really glad we got to see a good, uh, a, like a start sample of it. It's always tricky to share things here, but we'll make sure that with the documentation for all the projects that the video can be here, so uh, it can be there. So there will also be included um, uh, for someone to be able to see it as it's intended to be seen too, not playing from a computer and then streaming through Zoom as well. Uh, but I wanna make sure that we can uh, get our remaining two projects uh, into the into the mix. Um, this is a lot of, uh, also still a lot of amazing work. I know how frustrating it is for it not to present the way it was because we've been talking about it a lot this time, but I am gonna invite uh, Dream, the Dream team, which is not the same <laughs> as the use. It's a team of people working on dreams uh, to to uh, take over. Thanks for putting up the the collaborators uh, slide. Like I said, we'll we'll make sure that the the holodeck team is well represented within the uh, documentation on the uh, on the hackathon page as I, as it gets Absolutely. put together. Okay. Awesome. Uh, hi everyone, how are we doing? Good. Doing, doing all right, doing all right, cool. Um, <laughs> so my name is Tara and um, I proposed the idea called Dream Co-Creation. So I've been working with Dream since about 2016 in a collaborative um, live performance making setting. So I was super curious to see what does that similar process look like when we put it in a virtual sphere. So it's similar to the old fashioned process. Um, perhaps some of you have done this where you gather with your friends and you say, wow, I just had this dream last night and you share that dream and through the telling of the dream and, and processing um, the dream then transforms. And I thought VR would be a natural um, place to explore that because it is so full of, of possibility and it's such a dreamy, uh, process. Um, so just for the scope of this of this hack, we decided we would use Mozilla Hubs as a template so that we could go into that room. Um, we would select one dream and we would learn what assets are valuable for this type of experience. What assets would we want if we had this in front of a team of developers? And then what would that guided process be like for the users? Because we wanted the users to have um, some sort of uh, guidance, how to use the platform and also through the process of, of the, the, the dream processing, which there's one dreamer sharing their dream and everyone else is contributing to that room um, through art making. Uh, they go into room two, the avatars discuss and process that dream, discover new themes, and then they go back into room one and with that new information creates um, a new dream scene. So what assets were valuable? What, what do we like about hubs? What would we change? Um, and then what would that guided process look like to be the most friendly for the users who maybe haven't used that, that platform before? My collaborators were Rachel, Tayan, Michaela, and Ramona. And everyone basically just took an asset and um, reported back on their findings and everyone contributed to, to this dream room, which we're gonna take a look at now. Let me know if you can hear the audio. All right, welcome. So today I'm going to take you on a tour of a project entitled Dream Co-Creation. Before we get into the tour, I'd like to give you a little background about our project. This project is called the Dream Co-Creation app. This app allows users from different parts of the world to meet together in VR and share and transform their nightly dreams. A dreamer shares their dream and the other players listen, respond, and co-create using drawing, objects, text, and sound. What remains is a dream scene. For each scene, there is one dreamer and several co-creators. Dream scenes are then placed in a folder and archived. In this demo, we've decided that each dream scene has four rooms and a guided process. Today we'll explore one or two of those rooms. The background for this proposed project comes from my live practice of sharing dreams with artist friends. In this practice, we shared dreams verbally, then distilled movement and poetry from the dream text and turned it into performance. How does this translate to VR collaborative art making? 
And I, I was going to skip over this, but I think it's, it's, it's a valuable just to say the value statement. Um, I'm interested in using technology to further our, our humanity. Uh, so for me, exploring dreams is a worthy process of being seen and heard um, and sharing images from the subconscious if you're the dreamer. And it's also a worthy practice of practicing listening um, and transforming. Co-creation is something we do not usually practice enough. Um, as is authoring the dream and then letting go to the transformation process also has some pretty cool effects um, as per my experience in your life. We observed what worked in Mozilla Hubs and what we would change if we were creating a new platform and had a team of developers. Hey, yeah, we don't see any video. Let's check out Just the screen. You know. So warn you that. Sorry? I don't know if it's just me, but I don't see any video. Does everyone else see video? No. No, there's no video right now. And it wasn't even before. Like you were, yeah. I was just talking in the dark? Yeah. <laughs> you share your screen. I didn't share the screen. That no. is uh, that is exactly what I did not do. OK. I'm going to be shifting back and forth between a narrator voice which would be a part of the app how is that and then myself as tara no you still have to say the same so no, I'll try right. to there you go I'm obvious about when i'm in my dramatic narrator voice all right <laughs> there we go all right so you didn't get to see so the here we are entering this dream scene the dreamer has pre-recorded a dream video the dreamer has pre-selected a world for their dream to exist in, and perhaps also some audio pre-settings. Here I am as the narrator, speaking to the users as they arrive. Welcome to the dream world. This is not your ordinary reality. This is a world of possibility. In the dream world, we create new pathways. Dreams transform and take on new meanings. Here is a place where we co-create together and reimagine our futures. Welcome. Let's dream. Go ahead and enter the room by clicking the Enter Room text on the top right. Go ahead and look to your left. Look to your right. So I'd be guiding the user using your mouse or trackpad. In a few moments, you'll be listening to your friend's dream. One way to process dreams is through words. As you listen to the dream, Use the chat box to type in any words, images, or phrases you hear, and allow yourself to get creative. Here's an example. Click the wand on the left, and your text will be captured in the room. Feel free to type in as many phrases as you like, and listen to the dream once or twice. It's up to you. Click on the screen to start. This is my dream of flying. This is how I learned how to fly. There's a TV show when I was growing up called The Greatest American Hero. He had an alien suit that gave him super powers. He learned how to fly. These little three text phrases and creates a... So we skipped ahead here just because the sound was kind of wonky, but you see the process. We listened to Tan tell her whole dream and the, the typer types texts. A new poetry. One um, limitation of the platform is for some reason when I drag, it creates a clone. So ideally, there would just be one set of text. And I can actually resize it and create a little poem here on, on the left. Kind of like refrigerator poetry. What's remaining is the dream poem that the user made. It's kind of like refrigerator magnet poetry. So I'll read that aloud. How I learned how to fly. I see alien suits, three steps, superpowers. I fly away chasing. I don't remember, I do remember. 
I feel my stomach plummet, that feeling of up. But let's take a look around. We see over here we have this enable fly mode type backslash fly. I've already done that, so I won't do it again or it will disable it. And look, here is a area that I've prepared. One, two, three, three steps. And that's from Tan's dream, actually, if you recall. One, two, three. Now in fly mode, what's neat is that you can fly directly through um, objects. Oh, hey, look at this. We've discovered an area. It says, draw your feathers. So the feathers, um, the gift to the left was an object that I, that I pulled from, from um, different presets, objects using this create button, and so was this feather. But if the user was here, we would see the gif, the picture, the draw your feathers, and there would be an opportunity here to contribute to a feather collage. I've already done a few here, but it's fairly simple. Just click the pen and use the draw pad to create some nice feathers. A limit to this program is I can't figure out how to do different colors or pens. I'm sure one can, um, but again, I'm using this trackpad. It's kind of a limited option. Uh, another drawing option um, could be to use Tilt Brush, although that requires some technology that most people don't have. So this is really nice as far as everyone's able to draw. Click the pen to undo. I'll back up. Oh, I went through the wall again. And then similar to that uh, text project, the narrator would bop in and, and teach the, the user how to, to do that. And then that could be disabled once people understand how to use the different functions. And here I can fly up, up, up through the buildings, like in Dan's dream. Ooh. But for now, I'm just going to go back through this world and see what else we have. Oh, I see some text and an arrow up here. I'm certainly curious about that. I'm going to follow. It says straight up. I wonder what that means, straight up, huh? Let's, let's check that out. Straight up. There's the arrow. Looks like it's prompting me to go straight up that wall. Indeed it is, because I see the text, yes, this way. Whoa, check it out. Here's a hidden alien, just like in Tan's dream. What's up, alien guy? Maybe I want to add an object. Maybe I want someone to dance with this alien. This is how we added objects that were preset in the room, by the way. So I've left my mark. Maybe just for time, I'll move forward. This was another preset. Falling in a prayer, who could it be? So this was a neat an audio file that someone dropped in the room that the user could select and play. That's cool. Huh. And that was actually the theme song um, from the dream that Tan was talking about. So three different spaces were preset for the rooms to explore. There was a drawing option. People can contribute to the space. And here's our poetry, where we started. Let's explore. I have these portals preset. So this is room one. Room two is moving in fly portal. up to reach the portals to other dreams. So probably say other rooms, um, actually. But that is the next stage, is moving into And we can either two. get close to the portal, and then we simply click to to visit room. Imagine other avatars being in the room. Everyone can hear everyone's voice. Everyone can see each other's uh, robot bodies. <laughs> and here we have a conversation with the dreamer live about the dream. This is the, the, the process section of the dream. 
So one thing I've preset is a transcription, because sometimes if you can see the transcription, you can pick up on things you didn't see at first. So here's Tane's dream transcribed. There might be a one. And I'm wondering if we want to try um, if Rachel set up to do a live screen share of room two. If not, that's fine too. Um, so what you're seeing on the left. Say, instead of um, instead of doing a screen share, especially for the interest of time, I'm going to put the link to the room in the chat mm -hmm. and people can just later. jump in. Yeah. Great. So this is um, will appear in our avatar, so everyone has a little robot body, and we can talk, and everyone can hear each other, and there would be a guided process. And what you're only partially seeing on the left is, um, first of all, we we want to understand what's happening in the dream. So everyone who's a co-creator has the opportunity to ask the dreamer clarifying questions. Um, so tell me more about the buildings. Like, what did they look like? Oh, they were very dark, and they had no windows. Oh, that's interesting. How many buildings were there? There were three of them. Okay, so what happened after you jumped over the buildings? Was there anyone else in the dream? And you get to start to dig a little bit more deeply into uh, different themes that might come out. Well, my sister was in the dream. Oh, okay, what was your sister wearing? She was wearing this beautiful uh, white dress. Oh, that's interesting, especially in contrast to those dark buildings. Um, and you say that there were three buildings and there were also three steps that you were taking. Okay, so, so folks that are processing are starting to track themes. And in stage three, they, they reflect those themes back to the dreamer. And then what we didn't get into is then how we move through one more room and then back into room number one with that new information about the themes of the dream and how we might want to change it or resolve the dream even. Sometimes in dreams, there's a there's a central question that wants to be resolved. Well, how do I get from the dark buildings into a bright space? Well, maybe we fly up the buildings with those three steps and we create white clouds and you and your sister are there hanging out and celebrating. Or just as per example, um, the, the co-creators get to help move the narrative forward if there is a narrative, which as we know, sometimes there's not. But um, yeah, so that would be that would be our, our process. Um, so thank you very much to Rachel, Michaela, Tayan, and Ramona for offering their time. Everyone contributed both to the development of what the, the forum process would look like and also contributed to the room itself. Moving forward, we would, I would wanna beta test this with users just to see what their experience was and um, how we would want to streamline this, this process and what assets and, and does it make sense if the narrator is giving you guidance? How much guidance do they need? Because I really want it to be like someone like me, I don't have a headset. I've used one before, but I just have my PC. Um, I'd like that to be a, a possibility. Obviously, we didn't address the bandwidth issue. This could be streamed as a video, though, that people could download and just follow along as the process and then do it in their home with their friends. That would be one way to do it. Um, yeah. I think I, I think that's what we would uh, do. And then, and then once we were very clear and like what we wanted, then we could bring it to developers and say, here are the assets we need and here are the four rooms we need, et cetera. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much, Tara. Yeah. Thank you and, folks so much. And team, and team. I'm, I'm saying thank you, Tara, because I'm looking at Tara right now <laughs> on the screen. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got one more project to get to, and then we want to make sure that we have a little bit of time for conversation reactions, because one of the things is that people haven't necessarily seen, they've been privy to because the, the channels are open, so they might have hopped into the various things, but um, there's been so much intense uh, activity that it's been, it's hard to follow along, even if you're not on a team with all the activity that's been happening in all of those. And even though we're, and, and one thing that I know that, you know, every, everybody is really aiming for like showing the work, like the technical limitations that we have with presenting the work, I think also speaks to the yeah, amount the layers, yeah. of uh, work that has actually gone into the projects, right? Uh, that that uh, there's been so much that's gone into them that trying to encapsulate those in this like contained way while you're still figuring things out is also hard and then presenting that out, uh, outward as well so um i applaud everybody uh for for everything and encapsulating everything as best they can we as i said we still have another project so i want to turn it over to uh our our film room mm -hmm. Uh, uh, who now I know that the name has evolved since then, but I've been thinking about it as as film rooms the entire time. Um, but film room team, uh, 
Monument for Memory. Monument for Memory. Thank you, Justine. Sure. Your memory is better than mine. Uh, take it away. Right. Great. Can everyone see this? Yes. Perfect. Um, my name is Jake Saslov, and I am part of Monument for Memory. Um, so some background on me, I grew up in Richmond, Virginia, um, in the U.S., and if you don't know about Richmond, we've been in the news a lot lately um, because there's a giant street, uh, which is one of the main streets in Richmond, called Monument Avenue, and it's filled with monuments to Confederate generals. And so every day um, growing up, I would pass by these huge grand monuments to people who dedicated their lives to preserving slavery um, and were put up by people who intended to maintain white supremacy and intimidate and change history. Um, but in the past few days, we've seen this huge reclamation by protesters of these monument spaces. As you can see here, not only through um, adding context to the monument, through graffiti um, that highlight injustices and some of the pro and the problems that these uh, monuments reinforce, but also how it's become really a community space. Um, around the monument, there are all of these memorials to people who have been um, shot by the police, who have died at the hands of the police. Um, and on the weekends, it serves as a space for barbecues and celebrations and voter registration. Um, so with that in mind, one thing we want my group wanted to do with this project was create a model for what a contemporary monument can be. One that reclaims the idea of monuments for the community um, that they're in. And so to do that, we created Monument for Memory, an immersive media sculpture housed in an interactive 3D digital space that uses film, photographs, sound, and found objects to create an ethnographic assemblage to center the stories of members of the community in which it is built for and by. Uh, so coming off uh, Jake's lightning talk about the film rooms, we started discussing the material quality of media and the ways in which you might express memory and a layered kind of ephemerality, as well as composite the eventual collages uh, themselves. And so on the left here, we have Ella Boyd's work that looks at ref refraction and reflection. And then uh, Do Ho Su's work, which uh, examines the concepts of home and space in a very unique way. Uh, the next slide. Uh, and then we also started looking at more examples in our um, brainstorm iterative phase in this past week. So there's the Exquisite Forest by Google and Tate. That was a that was a browser-based branching narrative experience that users could contribute to. And then Line of Control by uh, Subodh Gupta for its powerful uh, structural presentation. And then more concretely for the resulting prototype and approach, uh, the 3D video sculpture on the left there by Masaki Fujihata called Voices of Aliveness, which is a database of people's recordings that they added to this composite. And then this inflatable balloon pavilion called scum, which is the Danish word for foam um, that we later, later in the process, um, brought up as a way to explore what a sculptural, um, what a sculptural installation might look like in 3D. And so the talk about how this sculpture would arise and present itself, we started talking and exploring the idea of verticality and how we might catalog and archive a media collection going upwards and reconfiguring what site specific might look like within a digital space. And so our first shot was in Vectorworks with a more literal attempt, uh, but we found abstraction would work in our favor considering the types of spaces we were all considering making. And so there was discussion around how a user might navigate as well. And so bringing back to the potential permeability of materials in a digital space, we abandoned the idea of having doors 
and walkways and instead emphasize and encourage a more fluid and flowing experience. And so the eventual structure was created in Cinema 4D, which we then imported to Unity, where we created and um, compiled everything. So we see this project as being kind of this larger prototype or framework for kind of developing maybe a larger project where it's sort of this monument that is sort of a constellation or kind of a collage of efforts where people can sort of submit or participate in um, giving us content to include in our sculpture. Um, and this week we sort of workshopped different ideas, especially around uh, multimedia. So we all sort of worked across different storytelling tools from video, 360 video, um, photographs and also working with photogrammetry uh, um, with the free app Displayland. Um, so what's important to us, I think, during this is to sort of work with technologies that are accessible um, to, to diverse communities. So to sort of uh, stigmatize this idea that immersive tech is kind of this expensive or um, kind of complicated um, hardware. We want to work with kind of these tools that can be um, accessed across a diverse um, set of communities and abilities. Um, and I think kind of working with these inexpensive um, and accessible tools it sort of opens up this idea of kind of museums and exhi exhibition spaces um, that can be sort of collaborative and that are sort of multi-authored. And we're interested in the idea of multi this multimedia almost archive. Um, and through kind of, I think, working in multimedia and in these immersive spaces, we can sort of open up um, these ideas of archiving memory that is more sensory, that is more embodied, um, that might be sort of erased or um, displaced in kind of stereotypical or classical archives or museum spaces. So I think there's a lot to play with there in terms of how we come up with content and the media that we use. Great, so what we ended up with was a um unity 3d app for both mac and windows that can be downloaded via a link from a google drive um, one thing that's really important to us is making this um software making the software accessible to the communities and um designed specifically for the communities which it's attempting to um memorialize so we took the challenge of how can we uh and the partnership between Team Morph and um, the Yukon, looking at how can we make this software accessible for people in the Yukon. So we had a few ways that we did that. One was through accessible hardware. So our program, while it's immersive, it doesn't rely on expensive hardware like VR headsets to enjoy. Um, and it requires limited CPU and RAM load that allows it to be played on just a normal laptop. Um, we also have a minimal reliance on the internet. Um, the file has been minimal, minimized to only 250 um, megabytes. So while it is an investment in time for people in the Yukon to download, um, it is nowhere near the amount of time that a movie would take or a lot of other applications um, and is still fairly doable. Furthermore, all the content has been front loaded into the app. So after the initial download, there's no internet access required for use. And then finally, we wanted to look at community distribution. Um, when we had the AMA with the Yukoners, one thing that was brought up was how there's often a community distribution of media to deal with issues of limited bandwidth. So someone may download one thing, put it onto a hard drive, and then pass it along um, to other people so that they can download it directly from the hard drive rather than from the internet. So by uploading it to Google Drive um, as just a downloadable zip file, we avoid traditional app marketplace and we make it a lot easier for users in the Yukon to transfer the app from one to one another. And so now we're going to show you a quick demo of what this app looks like.
Um, okay, good to know. So um, there is a little bit of an issue with that. So we're going to go on to our next section, which is future plans. I just noticed I'm <laughs> muted. <laughs> um, so thinking about next steps with this project, um, uh, one of the things we're thinking about is sort of the strategies for curating and creating and sort of crowdsourcing content um, and also kind of real world applications uh, that this project could be used for. Um, so we started off, I think, kind of the scope of this project being more sort of a global effort and even sort of through this hackathon experimenting, kind of collaborating, collaborating across uh, time and space. Um, but so I, I think the next sort of steps with this is to look at how this project might serve more kind of local communities and how maybe we see this working really well in the context of working with remote communities on the ground. So even kind of doing more participative like workshops, storytelling workshops on the ground with communities, uh, working with these tools that I sort of just described with these technologies and media creation tools, and then sort of bringing bring it in and adapting it to um, the virtual space. Um, that's one, one thing we're thinking about as well as possibly how can we sort of collaborate virtually through low tech means. So if that's sort of mailing each other <laughs> uh, content or um, there's been interesting projects, documentary projects of having people sort of phone call in and sort of recording oral histories that way. So those are sort of the next steps we'll, we're thinking about. Uh, as well, we talked about some improvements in design that we might look into um, investigating and seeing how they could potentially apply, like increasing immersion, improving the movement mechanics so that we have a more embodied and varied interaction with the environment, um, as well as researching those distribution models we've touched upon. Wonderful. And we have here a link to be able to download it, um, which Anyone in this, uh, anyone can actually download and play this app, uh, play our little, our example of what a framework could be like. Um, it's bit.ly slash monument number four memory. Right. Awesome. Uh, we're right here. Right, thank you so much for the presentations. We're right here towards the tail end. We're going to stay on as a as a group. Um, our live feed's about to end. Uh, I'm going to thank everybody who tuned in to the HowlRound and Facebook live feeds uh, to see all of the work that's gone into this last. Huge. Uh, yeah, a huge a huge amount of work that's gone into this last week of getting projects uh, quite far. Um, yeah, um, for our next steps in terms of what Team Morph means uh, moving ahead for the participants, we're going to keep the Discord open uh, so that you can continue to discuss the projects if you want to continue to push them forward. Um, have other conversations. There are a number of projects that actually we didn't do. Um, there were seven different projects that we had to put aside so we could so that we could focus our energies and there was a lot of energy on the five that uh, we did focus on uh, and but that's not to say that there wasn't a lot of interest in actually having those move forward and I know that there's been side conversations about maybe finding a way to put those forward as well uh, all of these presentations will get documented um, we document all of the stuff and make it available for what we're doing uh, in terms of the Toaster Lab Symposium series. So we will go on to the Atelier page uh, for access. We'll yeah. break up each of the presentations so that you can go to specific ones as well, um, similar to how we've done in the past. Uh, and one of the things that e even starting with our initial conversations, we are talking about is ways to support the projects moving forward, because there is so much that went into these and so uh, and so much potential for them that we've been thinking about how do they keep stay alive? Yeah, how do they keep going? Um, yeah, 
Is there anything else you wanted to? No, I just I extend my gratitude for everyone who's worked so hard this week. And we're looking forward to keeping the conversation going um, as we move to the next phase. So yeah. thanks, everybody. Yeah. So if you go to toasterlab.com slash atelier, uh, you can see all everything that we've been doing through this project, the projects that have come up. As part of the atelier that Toaster Lab has worked on directly, the mm -hmm. one that we've supported, uh, uh, associated and friend, uh, friendlies uh, that we've worked with before, all the presentations from the symposiums, we'll be continuing to do that. We're at the halfway point of this atelier project uh, and continuing to adapt to the realities. So thanks again for joining us today and looking through the presentations of everybody's hard work. Uh, one of the things that I miss about Zoom presentations is that because uh, everybody's on mute that it's nearly impossible to get a round of applause uh but uh sometimes i see sparkle fingers but we we know that everybody's there yes i start to see the hands pop up as well so we're going to stay on this zoom for a bit uh thank you everyone at howlround and uh facebook uh uh for watching thanks to the canopy council for supporting us and uh